Uh, hi there, today's vlog is about uh, pathways. So uh, it's for parents um, whose children are entering into the club system from the youngest ages and those who are trialling for reps and so forth. So um, yeah, here's a little bit of information that might be useful for you. What I want to sort of tap into is, uh, as a parent, if you've got a young child, six, seven years old, coming into the world of football, um, you're going to be looking for a club. Uh, you could, um, you're obviously going to register in for a local, for your local club, wherever that might be. Um, and you understand that uh, by bringing them into these clubs, it's um, basically a recreational club. So all grassroots clubs that are under the association banners. Um, so you have something like, I think it's 36 associations all over New South Wales and underneath each association um, are a group of clubs that they um, facilitate, they organise their competitions, um, ground allocations and all that kind of stuff. So these are association clubs, they're grassroots clubs, they're park football, we call it park football. Um, it's not professional coaching, what you'll get is a mother or a father who puts his hand up and, and volunteers his time. Very, very little resources are put towards coach education, if any. I don't think, you know, you might have a couple of coaches and managers meeting from time to time, it's about it. Some clubs are a bit more proactive than others, depending on the club, but in general you're going to get a dad or a mum who's probably never coached before, they just volunteers, puts their hand up and that's about as much as you're going to get. Um, if you want any expert coaching, you won't get it from an association club. The only place you'll get it from is either private coaching or an entity like ours, Foundation Football, that offers um, a more professional-based level of coaching, more structured. Um, so just bear in mind, um, if you see it, if you see that you know your child really enjoys their football and um, they show some advance capacities, you know, they could be a little bit more talented than, than other kids and, and you feel that they need a little extra, um, it's very unlikely that the grassroots clubs are going to be able to facilitate that for you. Um, it is very much at six, seven, eight years of age, it really is more than anything about fun, fun and frequency. Um, so obviously the more they play, the more they're going to enjoy it, the better they're going to get. Um, but again, in terms of structure, most teams, let's say at the under six levels, under seven levels, um, you're probably only train once a week with a game on the weekend. You might get a couple of um, dads who might be a little bit more enthusiastic and they might ask the club if they can have two nights a week. Um, there's some grading that happens. I'm not sure exactly what age groups are in all of the clubs, but in some of them it starts as young as eight or nine. Um, so that grading is done by parents and basically they don't know what they're looking for, they're just really just trying to, you know, separate the better kids from the weaker kids and in that case it's usually not anything to do with technique, it's usually got to do with size, um, running ability, things like that because, you know, without having a trained eye you really don't know what you're looking for. Um, the trial systems in, in themselves are varied, some of them will do one thing, others will do another thing. So. It's very much a disjointed um, system. Um, each association has their own set of rules. I guess they, they, they basically follow some sort of mandate, but in most cases, um, their entities on, on their own. Um, they operate in their own, their own ways. Some of them are more proactive, some of them are less proactive in terms of what they offer clubs and in terms of resourcing and, and things like that. Um, so you have to be really, um, you have to do your homework, really, and just try to work out um, exactly what's best for your kid. Um, if you are a sports family, you're a football family, um, like mine was, for example, and you take your, your football a little bit more seriously, and you want your son or your daughter to take their football a bit more seriously, um, training fortnight, as my wife calls it, is not going to be enough. Um, what I mean by training fortnight is... Um, the soccer season lasts six months, so six months in football, six months in cricket. In this day and age, everybody's playing summer comp, so generally you can go from the winter comp into a summer comp where you might not train, but you might play a game on weeknights in a five-a-side competition or a six-a-side competition or something like that. Uh, the reality is that um, if, uh, if you want any chance of your child succeeding or making it to a representative level, 
they're going to have to do a little bit more. They're going to have to have a, a little bit more coaching, a little bit more guidance on on the um, on the pathway on how to get to that level. Um, many many kids out there attending these private academies at a younger age, not so much the older age, because you 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 tend to have your rep football at your older age. So um, what we have is is a thing called SAP, um, which is supposed to be um, for the better kids, so the best played against the best. It starts at under nines, goes to under twelves, and then from under twelves it goes into youth football, which is representative football. Fees are higher, commitments are higher, travel is a lot more extensive. Um, it's very competitive. Um, Sixteen spaces usually per team, with only eleven playing on the weekend. Um, there's a, there is in general most clubs have an equal time policy, which is not always um, uh, facilitators are not always done. Some coaches just won't play some kids if they're not valuable to what their perception of of you know facilitating a, a winning team is. Um, we're very much outcome driven in this country, so everything's about the result. So that means if your son sort of you know maybe a little bit smaller or so forth, he might not get the same type of opportunities. You've also got to factor in the fact the set the fact that. Um, um, there's a quota of 16 players. Um, theoretically, you could get away with 13 players. Um, two substitutes would be better. Having 13 kids, having less kids in the team is actually easier to coach them. Um, and it means you don't need to rotate them so much during the game, which means you, you have a bit more consistency in the game. So, But everyone takes 16 kids, and it's mainly because... Um, the fees are high, and that money goes towards funding the club. Um, in some cases, it's to fund the wages of first grade players. In other cases, it's just to fund the expenses, which are not. So once they go from SAP into Youth League, there's um, three different divisions and then associations. So you've got MPL 1, MPL 2, MPL 3. Um, and then you've got association football. So... Um, Depending on how the level of your child will depend on what division he gets into, whether it's MPL one, MPL two. Um, standards between MPL one and MPL two are not much different football-wise. What you get is just um, maybe a little bit more athleticism in MPL one than you do in MPL two, and then uh, you've got this disparity of quality in the teams is a little bit less in MPL one than you've got in MPL two. So MPL two you might have half a team of really good players and half a team of boys that you're sort of carrying. Uh, whereas in MPL 1, you might have a situation where you have maybe three quarters of the team are pretty good and then the other quarter are, um, have um, probably been lucky to get in there, more or less. So, and that goes on until under 16s. Once they get to under 16s, um, you have a gap year, so basically there's no under 17, so that basically means that half of the kids that are playing under 16 will drop out, they'll either go down to lower division teams or they'll go back to park football. In many cases, they get to that age where they think, oh, you know, if I haven't made it by now, what's the point of being involved in rep football? So they give up, and when I say give up, they give up on the dream. They don't actually, give, not all of them give up on football, they end up playing in their local park sides and so forth. Um, the ones that are lucky enough to get selected into an under-18 team, usually you'll have maybe half the squad that are born um, in the 17 age bracket and the other half will be leftover kids from last year or kids that they've gotten from other teams. And then from the 18s, there's another gap year after that and it goes into the 20s. So as you can imagine, as you go higher and higher, there are fewer and fewer spaces left um, for kids to be able to continue to play at that sort of level. Um, so by the time you get to under 20, you really want to be pushing for a spot in the first team, um, especially when you're turning 20, because the following year at 21, um, there's no reserve team, which means you're an overage player, um, and so you need to get um, a spot in the first team if you want to play at either MPL 1, 2 or 3. So, and that's not easy to do. It's like a pyramid. Once you get to the top, the spaces are very, very limited, so you have to be extremely good at what you do. That's the reality of it. It doesn't matter what you did um, or where you played down below. Once you get to those higher levels, 
Um, it's what you do that matters, not where you've been or who's coached you or anything like that. It's how good you are, how much time and effort you've put into anything. So, yeah, not cheap. Um, so that sort of gives you an idea in a nutshell as to how all the competitions are structured and organised. Um, the, the SAP program is supposed to have qualified coaches. In many cases, a lot of these, there's so many licences out there, I think they've gone overboard with the licences that you've got four or five SAP programs in one area um, and these clubs are f struggling to bring players in because there's just not enough kids. So they're just picking any kids for the sake of picking them and so the quality of what SAP's supposed to be is not really as high as it should be. Um, and then on top of that, they can't even find coaches. So in most cases, sometimes you end up with another parent coaching and he doesn't get any support from the club. Um, you might get a little bit of support. You're supposed to have a C license, which is a two week course. You do over 10 weeks, I think, um, every Sunday over 10 weeks, which is a good course. You learn a fair bit from it, but it's not gonna make you or break you as a coach. You need experience and time. You need to understand how children think and things like that. And, and these courses don't cover any of that. So. You're basically um, winging most of the things that you're doing. Um, if you're lucky enough to have, you know, a good number of gifted kids, your team will do well. But if you don't and you don't know what you're doing, your team will struggle. As simple as that. You could be in a situation where your kids are copying 15 or 16 goals, um, which in itself is not a problem. That again, at the at the end of the day, you you know you have to sort of identify who is a good coach and who is a bad coach. And at the end of the day, just the result isn't always. An indication of whether or not that person is a good coach or a bad coach so there's a lot to learn a lot to find out um, so that's the, the the club system it's it's a quite a simple system but it's also quite complicated in, in, in the way that it's organized um, it's very competitive um, because the clubs lack structures especially at the representative they lack these technical structures um, it really is a merry-go-round, coaches coming and going from club to club, poaching players, always looking outside of their own nest to try to bring players in. So they're basically relying on other people to develop kids so that they can then poach them and bring them into their squads. Um, in some cases, they bring them in and they get rid of them a year later. So it's generally not about the coach, it's about the kids, the onus is on the kids performing and and. You know, depending on how the coach treats the kid, depending on how the coach plays his football, whether or not it's going to suit that child the way he plays, whether or not he's going to try to help that child to fit into the squad, well, that's another story. So these are these are things that you need to um, keep into perspective when, when you're out there in the big bad world of representative football. Um, so, yeah, so that's basically it. Um, for me, the best advice I can give parents is to do your research. It's, it's as simple as that. And I mean, what I mean by doing your research is it's not, it's not enough to talk to other parents. They may have some information, but you, you need to do a lot more than that. You really need to do, know the ins and outs of, of everything you're doing, basically.